Hi everyone! In today's video, I'm going to share my very first attempt at Sashko. This is a coaster set that my mom brought for me back from Japan, and it's in this arrow dart um, feathers pattern. So as a beginner's tip, they have these little kits that are available. Now in Japan, these kits are only about $5. So this is the one I worked on today. It's called Yawane, which is arrow dart feathers. It's taken after bird feathers attached to the tip of arrows used in archery. It also has the Nowaki, which is wind-blown grass. It's depicted by the shape of dune grasses and a strong sea breeze. It comes with a Sashko needle by Olympus, as well as their Sashko threads in two colors, uh, the blue and the yellow. And then on this little sampler, it has all of the instructions in the pamphlet. Now, even the kits that are sold in the US, I believe are the instructions are only in Japanese. So I will try to explain them in this video um, in English. It's really basic, especially if you already do things like quilting, then you're not going to have any problem with this at all. So these are the cut lines where you can cut um, to have the seam allowance for each coaster. You'll notice that this is only single. Um, this one does not have the backside fabric. So if you want something thicker for it to be like a true coaster, then I recommend that you also get some felt, um, maybe some interfacing and felt, and iron those onto the back, which I'm undecided. I haven't decided if I wanna keep it this way or if I wanna use these as patches. So I also have set number 262, which has the Shippotsunagi, as well as the Seigaiha. And both of these, um, the overlapping concentric circles, they're very traditional designs. And again, this one comes with the two different colors of um, Sarashi, I'm sorry, not Sarashi, Sashiko thread as well. The bigger kits, you'll see the amount for yen that my mom was able to purchase these. In Japan, these kits are only about eight to $10. I wanna say here, they're like 25 to $30 if you're able to find them on Amazon. But that's still quite a deal getting them on Amazon because the pricing with shipping can be quite a bit from Japan. So this one has some different designs. I'm not quite sure how to do the dots. So I'm looking forward to learning how to add these different little features um, on those Fukin uh, ones as well. This is probably the most intricate one I have so far. So this one is Sakura or Cherry Blossom and it's done all on that grid. I'm not sure if this is the basting thread or if this is also um, Sashiko thread here as well. But this one is very detailed and will probably take me some time. It is a fukin as well, which means it's like a dish, you can use it as a dishcloth, um, hana fukin. So you can use it for dishes or for you know covering up vegetables, um, things like that in the kitchen. So I don't know, after doing that much stitching, I don't know if I have the heart to put that one in the kitchen. Now, if you're looking for some cheaper alternatives that might be sold here in the States, there's also this brand from Japan called Daruma, and these are a little bit less expensive on, um, on Amazon, but these do not come with the thread and the needle. I don't think they do at least. I think these are just the fabric. And then this is the most advanced one. This is the Sashiko cloth. So the grid is on there. And in this kit, it comes with these chalk pencils. So you can draw your design on there and then stitch your design. So we'll start unpacking this package for the Olympus 263. I'm going to start with the design, the Yabane design, which is the arrow feathers design. And it's really nice because this diagram here that they give us, it shows us exactly how to do the stitching. So for round one, this would be one continuous thread from end to end would go all the way around on this perimeter. 
Then number two will start at the base of this line and you'll follow that line straight, keep the thread connected, go down, thread connected again, go up, thread still connected, then do the zigzag. So this is like trying to figure out how to do a contour line um, on without any stops. The fewest amount of stops as possible is really how um, this type of design works. And so here it does another jump, goes all the way up, a little zigzag, and then we go all the way down, we do a final jump, and then come all the way up where we actually end at the corner. So there's always a planning strategy to getting these threads um, to go where you don't end up having to do all these cuts. So that's really cool. So we'll start with number one. So they give you the instructions to make sure to wash before you iron. It's really important to wash it so that you get all that design out of it so that you don't press those lines into the fabric. And then they give us the measurements, um, 13 centimeters and then our seam allowance of the 1.5 centimeters. So again, this these are measured in metric, just so that you know, um, they are not measured in inches. They show us how to miter the corners. So if you know how to do this part in quilting, this is going to be really easy for you. You'll see I'm going to struggle just a little bit with that. Untying the knot from a sashko skein of thread is much like uh, dealing with yarn or embroidery thread. It's just thinner than yarn and thicker than embroidery thread. So this one is already nicely cut for us on the very bottom. So I'm going to be just pulling from the loop at the very top. So I'll just find one strand of thread, hold the neck or throat of the area very tight as I gently pull out only one strand and that'll make sure that it doesn't get knotted. Um, you'll want to pull it gently and then you'll see that all those fibers will just fall right back in place they will not end up knotting on themselves. And I'll just lay them on the side. Here you can choose to put them on a bobbin if you like, or just keep them on the side. Japanese packaging is always rather ingenious. So you'll see these two little arrows at the upper corner, which means squeeze those so that they go out. So that automatically opens the package where they already have it perforated and then the needle is just able to fall out from there. So it's really nice, there's no peeling or back of the material or anything, it just automatically opens. Now you'll notice with a sashko needle, the eye is quite a bit larger than your typical embroidery needle, and that's because the sashko thread is quite a bit thicker, so it has a big eye on it. So this is where my little handy dandy embroidery kit that I showed in one of my previous videos becomes really handy. I'll link it above here. I have this cute little bee um, threader and so I'm just going to stick the wire through the um, large eye, the big eye of the needle and then I'll be able to drag my sashko thread uh, straight through the needle of this eye. As a side note, I do not put a knot at the end of this. With sashko, especially using a sashko thread, you do not have to use a knot, especially on a home goods item like this that isn't going to be, um, I don't know, pulled on too much, like it's not clothing. I only use knots on clothing, but um, for something like this, you don't have to use knots at all with the overlap that we'll be doing. So I'm going to use my fabric scissors here and just cut along these seam allowance lines so that I can separate this design from the other one. This type of fabric does tend to fray very easily. So um, make sure you are using fabric only scissors because it will really get hung up or start fraying on you much worse 
if you don't use the right kind of scissors. So to get started, we want to start with a back stitch. So we'll start from about the third stitch in from the corner, work our way back, and then come back forwards by overlapping on top of those first few stitches, and that will lock these stitches in place. Kind of like what you do with a sewing machine when you go forwards and backwards um, at the very beginning and this will lock those stitches in place without us having to put a knot. So now I'll just start stitching down this entire line in the straight line. You want to make sure that the uh, thread doesn't get too tangled up in the back. I usually work about half of the stitches on these lines at a time before I pull my needle through. Again, try to remember to pull on the fabric and not the needle. I start getting this technique down a little better toward the end of the project. But if you remember to pull on the fabric and not the needle, it will make your life so much easier as you're pulling the thread through these stitches. So two things to note here. First, you'll see my original tail still sticking out there a little bit. Then also right here, make sure to leave a loop. You want to leave some slack for your fabric um, so that it doesn't bunch up on you, especially while you're making a border like this one. Um, it's very important on these corners to leave the loops every time you come around a right angle like that. And it will just make all the difference in your fabric not buckling and being able to lay flat. So a very important Sashko notion is this coin thimble. Put it on your middle finger like so, and you'll be able to push that needle through with your hand without too much of a struggle, without causing injury to yourself as well. This is my favorite tool and this is my favorite method. There's different ways to do sashko. You can push with this part of your hand or you can push with a different type of thimble that's higher up on that third finger. But I really have liked this method. Um, it feels really comfortable on my hand and this was really easy for me to adjust to. So after you've pulled through each line, you'll want to make sure to give a good spread out finger press on both sides of the fabric because it'll want to bunch up on you and you'll just want to make sure that all these stitches are laying nice and flat before you make that corner. Now another important thing is to make sure that your last stitch comes up and that you have this nice space between the end of that line and the beginning of your next line. So here I was trying to make sure I was really careful on making this corner with that space. Same thing for each corner on the back side. You want to make sure to leave some slack, leave a little bit of a loop back there so that again it can lay flat and the fabric doesn't get all bunched up. So each time I come to a corner, making sure to pull up a little bit of a loop, and then I'll continue going with that stitching. So on this third side, I'm getting a little bit braver, and I'm trying to see if I can actually load all of the stitches on this one side in one pass with this needle. Um, I've heard one say that they're usually able to load as much as six inches of fabric um, on their sashko needle all in one pass. This becomes really important when you're working on, say, for example, clothing and you have a much larger surface area 
that you're trying to cover, um, it will make the visible mending go a lot faster um, if you're able to do these long passes. So sashiko needles come in different lengths. Some of them are long and some of them are short, but these long needles are especially good for straight lines so that you can load as many stitches as possible. So as I come to an end at the end of this fourth line, I'm on the back of the fabric here. And it's important that this last stitch come down into the back so that I can make this loop on the other side after I flatten all these stitches um, because this is the end of the line. So this is where I will do some overlapping stitches in order to finish out this portion. As I pull this through, I want to make sure to also leave a loop on this end as well. So I'll have two loops here. One is from the beginning point and the other loop is for the ending point. And then this is where I will overlap um, those three stitches here just at the very end just to lock them in place. So to start line two, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to go backwards for a few stitches first, and then I'll come forwards again. I will also leave a slight tail on the back side um, where I will be overlapping. So as we make this jump to another row, we don't have to cut the thread. We just leave a loop with some space, some slack here on the back, and then start the next line. So as I jump to this next line, the same thing, I'm going to leave a loose loop on the back and then I'll continue the stitching. Now we'll jump into the zigzag stitches and on these it's the same thing, leave a bit of a slack right here before I start into the zigzags and then continue. Now these get a little tricky because you want to leave um, the spacing and you know, I am a beginner, so here this spacing is not the best. This corner is pretty tight and I kind of struggle with this one, but my other zigzags get better. So we'll review what went well and what didn't at the end of this project. So I find to get the sharpest edges and the best spacing, um, at these zigzags is to first do the three stitches in between and then go down at the end of this last stitch, pull it all the way through, give it a little bit of slack on the back side, and then come back up, do that turn um, after I've taken the slack out of the fabric, um, and then come back up out of the fabric to get that nice 90 degree clean turn. So this is how the end of my last um, zigzag portion looks. So now we're going to start doing all of those other lines and finish out this design. So some key points that you want to watch for as you're stitching is making sure that as you come to an end of a line, that it's not touching the next line. 
spacing is very important. Then as you make each turn, uh, make sure to still leave that slack in the back so that the rest of the fabric doesn't buckle. So every turn, just make sure to leave that slack. Here it's starting to get easier for me as I really realize that I need to be working more with the fabric instead of the needle. Um, and as I approach this line, these corners, make sure to have this space in the corner as well. So you get a nice clean corner and then you come all the way down and pull the fabric. And then you end up with this nice spacing that gives you that arrow look for the tip. Now that I've come to the end of this thread, I'll clip it so it has a slight tail. The tail is sticking straight up, so I know it doesn't look like I left much of a tail, but there is one there. So I'm going to go back to the top of my loop and pull just very gently um, one more strand of blue out of this um, grouping that I have. And now, instead of making a knot, same thing for this, we just um, put it into our needle and then we overlap over the last few stitches in order to um, make like an overlocking stitch and we're able to continue without a knot. So I'm really finding my groove now that I'm at the last line, of course. Isn't that how it always works? But I've learned how to maneuver the fabric um, instead of the needle and now it's flowing so much faster. So the key here again is watching the spacing as we come up to that join where the arrow comes to a point, make sure to leave a space in that location and that gives it that really nice um, sharp angle look that we like with Sashko stitching so much. So not all of my spacings are just right, um, but I definitely enjoyed getting in the groove of this process and finding my rhythm um, with the stitching. And that's what I love about these samples. They help me get a feel for what the length of a Sashko stitch should kind of feel like and how I can get into that rhythm, even when I do find my own size in the future that I like. So after I pull out this last thread, I'm just going to wash it. When you wash it, you'll get some frayed edges, so you can just trim those off. I'm going to leave all my loops on the back of this one. Since this isn't going to show anyway, I'm going to be attaching some interfacing and probably some felt so that it can absorb water better as a coaster. But for now, I'm going to miter my corners. Again, they did not turn out great. I need to work on that. And then these are some other few areas that I need to work on. I was happy with my corners. I did get the spacing just right um, on the corner. And as I turned, this one's a little bit wonky, um, but the other three came out pretty good. I also like this spacing on these points for these arrows. Most of those came out pretty good. Um, not of all of them are even. And then this one definitely needed some help. That was that first corner that I struggled with. But overall, I'm really happy with how my stitching turned out, especially for my first project. And it's a really great little coaster. It's really cute, just the right size. So I hope you enjoy trying these samplers out just as much as I did. If you like more videos like this, please give it a thumbs up and check out the next videos. I'll also post the links for where I found my supplies below and I'll see you on the next one.